Um, I'm just going to give some introductions to this. I'm going to turn it over to Chris, uh, who's going to introduce our wonderful speakers for this evening. I think you're really going to enjoy it. But before we do that, I want to give you, like they used to do on TV, previews of coming attractions. Previews we are already more. Um, I want the next one, don't I? This is the one I want to tell you about. We've decided on the topic for the winter spring semester open classroom, which will start next January 12th. And it's one I've been wanting to do for a long time, and it's called Demography is Destiny. And it's all about how demographic change affects everything in life. We're going to look at it from the neighborhood to the, to the state, to the national government, to you know, why does the economist now tell us that India will overtake China by 2025? We're going to look at uh, changes in racial and ethnic composition, changes in the way our families are structured. We're going to talk about the impact of this on the economy. We're going to talk about this on the impact on politics. It's going to be just fabulous. <laughs> we are looking for a couple or three volunteers to help us do some research for and during the break, if any of you have a little spare time, would like to become junior researchers, see John, okay? And he'll take your name and email. Because we want to pull together some really fascinating materials, including we want to do some lots of graphic stuff. And so we've got a lot of probing to do on the internet, and we have a lot of probing to do on, uh, uh, on kind of the speakers we want to. So, Demography is Destiny, next semester. This will be the sixth semester of the Open Classroom. Um, uh, I also want to tell you about something coming up very soon, and that is next Wednesday, uh, we move to talk about education, training, and workforce development. We have two additional wonderful speakers joining us. Uh, Paul Harrington, our own Paul Harrington, here from our School of Public Policy, uh, and Charlie Lyons, who is the superintendent of the Shawshine Valley Regional Technical High School, was also a selectman in the town of Arlington, and was somehow able to parlay his role as a selectman in a small town in Massachusetts into becoming president of the National League of Cities, probably one of the most important organizations of cities and local governments. In fact, the Mass Municipal Association, which Jeff leads, is a member of the NSA. So that's going to be really terrific. Um, as you know, this evening, we're turning to the whole question of regionalism and local government. And uh, Chris is going to introduce our speakers. But before he does this, I want to just take about two minutes to tell you why I think this is so important. Um, a couple of years ago, working with Jeff, the Dukakis Center and the Mass Municipal Association held a conference called Regionalism, Macro, Micro, mini and nano. <laughs> and the idea was that everybody seems to be scared of this word regionalism. You know, if we go into some kind of regional compact with the three towns around us, we'll either lose our varsity high school football team or we'll lose our police officers or something horrible will happen. And what we wanted to say is you don't have to think about regionalism as though we're going to merge 351 towns and cities instantly into four large regions. But is it possible to begin to share some resources and work together more closely? EMTs, uh, a dog catcher, and ultimately maybe more. Since that conference, which we thought might attract 30 to 40 people, and if I remember Jeff, attracted over 200 mm -hmm. city and town leaders from around the Commonwealth, I think the argument, and I don't want to steal their thunder, for doing more things regional has become stronger. And the reason for that is nothing less than the current fiscal crisis, and what I talked about, I think, on the first class, which is a lingering structural deficit at both the state level and the local level that could go on for years and years and years, and lots of the demographics and a lot of the economics behind it. It's going to make it more and more difficult for local communities to continue to offer the entire array of services they would like to offer uh, without finding some way of economizing and having some economies of scale in it. So, when we talk about policy advice to the governor, one of the things we think the governor, whoever is governor for the next four years after uh, their inauguration in January, 
is going to have to think about this issue of regionalism and how they work with the Mass Municipal Association, how they work with mayors, including the mayor of Salem, to begin to think about how to do this in new and exciting ways that um, actually improve life in every town and city in Massachusetts, uh, but do it in such a way that it's more efficient and effective. So I am really looking forward uh, to hearing our speakers tonight, as I know you are, and Chris will do the honors of introducing them. Great. Thank you. John Sarver. Thanks, Barry. Uh, you said some things I was going to say, so I'll say some other things. Um, actually, what I was going to say at the very beginning of this is when we looked at this theme for tonight, I thought my eyes glaze over. Uh, and indeed, this is one of those topics where if you mention regionalism and local government to people, their first initial reaction is, their initial reaction is boring. And then I say, let's close your library. And they go, no, you can't do that. And indeed, that's the, the crux of the dilemma here in Massachusetts, which is, which is, with its 351 famously independent uh, cities and towns, ranging from Boston to Gosnold on the uh, Elizabeth Islands. I think that's the smallest one, isn't it? Um, that each of these cities and towns in Massachusetts um, you know, jealously guards some of its prerogatives in terms of the services it delivers to its residents and taxpayers. And, and indeed, the dilemma, as Barry put it, is how do you deliver the services that citizens, taxpayers want in an efficient, effective manner that's also, as I pointed out last week, accountable and equitable? It's the same, that said, that said dilemma as we pointed out last week. And indeed, this is the third week, if you want to think about it this way, exploring this dilemma. Two weeks ago, we looked at direct provision of services and talked about public employee unions. Last week, it was more the indirect provision of services through uh, third parties, in this case, nonprofit organizations. And today, it's a slightly different angle, but the same dilemma, local governments. To what degree will local governments be autonomous in delivering services to their taxpayers on their own bottoms, whether it's Gosnold or Boston? And to what degree will they somewhat reluctantly sometimes pool their resources, join together in more regional compacts, perhaps surrender some autonomy for some efficiency? Um, this is one of the great dilemmas. And indeed, every town faces these kinds of dilemmas. Every town wants control over its own police, its own fire, its schools, and yet they want to economize. And Massachusetts, unlike a lot of Midwestern, Midwestern states where I come from, does not have really functional county government. Um, it had county government for a while, but we typically got rid of it because it didn't really do anything except, in our perception, these run up bills. Uh, it, it, it runs sheriff's offices, but that's not really county government. That's just a sheriff's office for the most part, and, and maybe some court functions. Whereas back in Ohio, where I come from, county government has real functions, um, and it's also debated. So in Massachusetts, with its colonial legacy of famously independent, autonomous towns, the real dilemma is still the traditional one that you very point out: how do you deliver services efficiently, effectively, uh, without you know, uh, without in fact. Uh, sacrificing accountability and indeed equity. Tonight we have really two, two great guests to, deliver, to, to address this dilemma. Uh, Jeff Beckwith is the executive director of the Massachusetts Municipal Association. The MMA represents those 351 cities and towns uh, to the legislature, to the, to, the, to, the, to the state government, indeed, and partly and also in, in discussions at the national level. Um, Jeff will offer a, a sort of a broader macro perspective on the dilemma, given his experience in running the MMA. Uh, he's been director, executive director since 1992. Previously, um, he had a stint in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, where he was vice chairman of the Committee on Government Regulation, and he also served on committees on taxation, natural resources and agriculture, and housing and urban development. He's also you know, a lecturer in political science at Emanuel College, he was an assistant to the Massachusetts Commissioner of Commerce and Development, administrative assistant to the Reading Board of Selectmen, and not only back down to, in fact, a legislative assistant in the House of Representatives. Um, he is a um, graduate of Boston College and also was a visiting scholar at the Harvard School of Public Health. So Jeff comes to us with a long experience in state government and local government, and as the M and directing the MMA, has really seen it up front and personal for the last tw almost 20 years. Uh, Kim Driscoll is mayor of Salem, having served in this office since January of 2006. Um, she is uh, you know, the city's 
According to the website, the city's first woman mayor, and prior to being elected mayor, served as deputy city manager for the city of Chelsea, Massachusetts. Um, and another, an interesting, famous example of local government that had to be, in some respects, also had to be bailed out or, and restructured um, because of its size, because of its dysfunction at the time. Uh, she spent, previously that four years as corporation counsel to the city of Chelsea, um, and she has extensive background in planning and land use development, and worked in real estate and commercial development uh, in private practice, as well as serving as community development director in the city of Beverly, and an assistant planner for the city of Salem. And in addition, she has uh, served up two terms on the Salem City Council. She's a proud graduate of Salem State College, now a university. So you know, she has not gone far, even though she has gone far, she has not gone that far geographically, uh, which I suspect the city of people of Salem like that very much. So uh, without further ado, Jeff Beckwith first, and then Kim Driscoll. <laughs> 